And as, as discussed, and you can tell with this title right here, I'm talking about ice loss around the globe um, from glaciers, both small and large. But one of the biggest challenges with understanding ice loss around the globe and its impacts is wrapping our heads around the scale of ice on our planet. So the very first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna take a tour from where we are here in Rhode Island to the largest ice in the world. Um, we, here we are. I'm staying at a hotel um, that's down here. It's about a 10 minute drive. And the thing that I want you to pay attention to as we take this tour is this scale bar down here. So here we're looking at a two mile scale bar and we can see a lot of the region that we're in here, right? So now we're going to start to move to the different places where we have ice on the globe. And one of the first places we're gonna move is where we find um, mountain glaciers. So there are different sizes of ice on the globe. And as a glaciologist, we speak um, about them with different language. So the, one of the smallest kinds of um, ice we talk about are mountain glaciers. So first we're gonna transition here at this scale over to Mount Rainier in Washington. Um, you can see these are all, uh, here's the summit of the peak here, and we have glaciers on all these different sides. So these are glaciers that are on a single mountain, but you can get a sense already that even though these are small, this entire area here that we are looking at would be covered in, in ice and rock, right? So now we need to continue to zoom out so that we can prepare to look at bigger ice. So moving from um, two miles up to this 13 mile scale, and here we have Mount Rainier, and here is Tacoma um, here at, at uh, uh, sea level. So we're starting to get a sense of what we can cover with this kind of scale, and we're gonna transition from looking here at Mount Rainier in Washington up to Southeast Alaska, where we're looking at an ice cap so sometimes we hear people talk about ice caps and they mean sea ice on, on the Arctic Ocean, but ice cap is actually a technical term that we glaciologists use to describe a landscape where we have multiple glaciers that are draining an area of shared ice. So here, this is Columbia Glacier. It's actually retreated about 12 miles since the 1980s from down here out of this picture but you can get a sense that all of this ice in this area is connected. But in order to see it, once again, we need to zoom out from this 13 mile perspective to this 30 mile perspective. And you're getting a sense of this connected ice cap system with glaciers draining to the north, to the south, and in all directions. So we've moved from small mountain glaciers to larger ice caps that we find in Alaska, the Canadian Arctic, the Himalaya, Patagonia. But we now need to start moving towards the biggest ice on Earth. So we're gonna zoom out um, from this, we're gonna keep this scale and move over to the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, this glacier here is Jakobshavn Glacier, also known as Sermet Kujalech in Greenlandic. And um, there's actually a little town down here. Of course, we can't see it at all on this scale. And these blue dots here are actually lakes that form on top of the ice sheet around the edge in summer, um, lakes of glacial melt. Um, but at this 30 mile scale, we're seeing only a very small fraction of the Greenland ice sheet. So we're gonna zoom out here to 710 miles, right? A big, huge jump. And you can get a sense that this was the little area we were looking at before. And you can now understand how we're thinking about an ice sheet that's actually sitting on the largest island in the world. Um, with ice caps here in the Canadian Arctic um, and some mountain glaciers here in Iceland. But this is still not the largest ice in the world. For that, we have to head south to Antarctica. So we're gonna take this scale and we're gonna move south to Antarctica. Antarctica, you can see, is um, it's shaped kind of like you're out hitchhiking and here, um, like this, right? And um, this is actually West Antarctica. Uh, so we have the West Antarctic ice sheet. These are the trans-Antarctic mountains here. And then the Antarctic Peninsula pointing up here to South America. But again, we're getting only a fraction of what this ice sheet has to show us. And here we have to zoom out 
to a scale where we're actually capturing the curvature of the Earth in our perspective to capture the Antarctic ice sheet. And we can understand why Antarctica is a continent. All right, so we've now managed to move from small mountain glaciers to larger ice caps to the large ice sheets of the globe, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. And we can, have, we can understand how these all fit together on the globe. So these in blue are all of our smaller mountain glaciers and ice caps, and then we have the ice sheet in Antarctica and Greenland. But why in the world do we even have these glaciers all over the globe? Why are there glaciers here? almost at the equator. Um, I want to talk briefly about how it is that we make a glacier. So in order to make a glacier, we have to have snow that is sticking around year to year, right? We have to pile down snow here, and then we as we warm things up in summer, we have to not lose all of that snow so that it can stick around year after year, building up snow that's becoming more dense and building up glacier ice. And so there are two ingredients that play a role here, temperature and precipitation. On the one hand, we can have places that have fairly high temperatures, and they can sustain glaciers because they have high precipitation also. So here on Mount Rainier, our annual snowfall is about 60 feet per year. So it doesn't matter that the average temperature is 50 degrees Fahrenheit because the summer's just not long enough to melt all of that 60 feet of snow. So we can have glaciers here in pretty warm places, and that's true for our tropical glaciers. And then on the other end of the, of the um, spectrum, we can have glaciers that occur in places where we have very low precipitation. So this is in Glacier National Park in Montana, my home state, and we get only about 12 feet of snowfall per year. But because we have cold average temperatures, we still can't manage to melt all of that snow. There are places in East Antarctica that are technically a desert. But because the few centimeters of snow that fall each year simply can't melt, we can build up an ice sheet that is miles thick. All right, so we've managed to build these glaciers all over the globe. And you have a sense of kind of the spatial extent of them and how, how wide these can be. But we don't care quite as much about the area of all of these as we care about the mass, right? It doesn't matter maybe as much that I'm 5'3", it's more that I'm 125 pounds, right? So it's the same with ice. Uh, we have to understand its mass, and that requires that we understand not just the area but the thickness, right? And this is another number that's really hard to wrap our heads around. Um, the center of the Greenland ice sheet, the ice is about two miles thick. That's the same as taking 30 Statues of Liberty, stacking them all on top of each other from ground to the tip of that torch. The center of the Antarctic ice sheet is more than three miles thick. Imagine the next time you go on a community 5K run that you were just spending that entire race running from the bottom of the ice sheet to the top of the ice sheet in a straight line. And then you have a sense of how much ice we have in these locations. So, now that we have a sense of how much ice there is, we can take a look at um, how we're measuring it. But I want to introduce a really important metric. As a glaciologist, the number that we most often use to describe how much ice there is on Earth is the gigaton. This is what a gigaton looks like. A gigaton is one trillion tons. Uh, each of these cubes is one gigaton. So you can see one, two, three gigatons here sitting in the middle of downtown Manhattan. And one of these gigatons is about 400,000 Olympic swimming pools of water. So as I move to this next slide and I'm showing you gigaton numbers, you have to start to imagine more swimming pools than you've ever seen in your entire life or ever will, right? And these are the numbers. These are why we can talk about ice around the globe having an impact on an ocean that covers most of our planet. So this is what ice loss has looked like from 20, 1961 up to 2016. This is the cumulative total. 
And I do want to point out, these are just totals for these areas in orange. So we're not including this interior ice sheet for Greenland or here in Antarctica. I'll add those numbers in a minute. But what you can see really clearly is that we're losing ice all over the globe. There's one area here in the um, Western Asia where we've actually gained some ice during this period. But that's not particularly surprising because remember, we need temperature and we need precipitation. And as we're raising the global temperature, some places we're getting more precipitation and some places we're getting less. But those places where even as it's warming, we're getting substantially more precipitation, we can actually grow a glacier in warmer temperatures because we have more snow. But at some point, those temperatures are going to keep rising, and that more precipitation is going to become rain instead of snow, and those glaciers are going to start to decline again. That's something, for example, that we saw happen in New Zealand, where earlier in the 21st century, we actually got bigger glaciers for a period of time because we were getting more snow even as the temperature was rising. But for most glaciers around the world, those rising temperatures are doing them, doing them in. So you can get a sense that we have a 3,000 gigatons of ice lost from the Alaska region, um, 1,000 gigatons from the Russian Arctic. And if we add in uh, the Greenland ice sheet, where we just between 2000 and 2016, so I'm cutting out the earlier 40 years between 1960 and 2000, because I'll tell you there wasn't a lot of ice loss during that period of time. And we just look at since 2000, we're up here close to 4,000 gigatons in Greenland, close to 2,000 gigatons in Antarctica. So what does this, how do we know this, right? We have these big numbers but spread all across the globe. Why in the world should you believe what I'm telling you and how in the world do we know this to be true? Well, there are a whole variety of ways in which we measure land ice. Some of them are pretty low tech. There are glaciers around the world where people have been hiking to those glaciers, measuring where the end of it is, and recording that in a notebook for hundreds of years. So there are some glaciers that we have direct measurements like that over more than 100 years, and that's been really helpful. There are other places where we can use old photographs like this, and we can compare how much glacier there was here in 1940 with what we can take in this photograph now. If we didn't have this photograph from a days in the past, we could arrive at this landscape, and we could find areas of um, where vegetation has started to grow. And we can look at how, when did this vegetation start to grow? When was this area uncovered by ice? And so in that way, we can build a record back in time even before we were out there measuring it. But there are some really important instruments in glaciology that have completely changed the game, and those are satellites. The development of satellite technology, particularly since the um, late 1990s and in through the 2000s, have completely revolutionized our understanding of ice on Earth because that's allowed us to look at ice the size of Greenland and the size of Antarctica. So I want to mention two satellites that are up right now that give us different methods of measuring the ice. One of them is ICESat-2. These are both NASA satellites. This satellite is flying around, and it's a laser. It's sending down a laser beam to the surface of the Earth. That laser is bouncing off the surface and being received back here at the satellite. And in that way, it's measuring the surface topography of the Earth. So we can fly over an ice sheet, measure the shape of the surface, and then we can fly over that ice sheet again later, measure the surface again, and see, has that surface gone up or that surface gone down? That easy. Um, I mean, it's not that easy, but. <laughs> uh, and then the other satellite I want to tell you about is a completely different method for understanding how much mass there is in this ice. Um, and this is called the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment Satellite. We're actually in number two, so the original satellite was just GRACE, and now we're in, a, in the follow-on. So this is a, a replica of the same satellite. And this is fascinating. This satellite actually measures the pull of gravity on the Earth. And when you have a large mass of ice or a large mountain range, 
those masses actually change the gravitational pull of the Earth. And what happens is these satellites respond to it. So say this right here was my big ice sheet. These satellites, it's a pair of them. And what they're actually measuring is this distance between them. And they're flying along together. And here, this mass, this big mass of ice, is going to start to pull on this first satellite first. And they're going to get far apart. And then as they're traveling over it, they're both feeling the pull of this big ice. But as they're moving over here, this one is not feeling the pull of this so much anymore, right? Because it's getting further away. Well, this one's still feeling it. And that whole time, they're, they're measuring how close together or far apart they are. And in that way, this pair of satellites is measuring the change in gravity of our Earth. And the mass of ice is directly changing that gravity. So this is an a very direct way of measuring how much ice we have in different locations on Earth. It's been revolutionary for us understanding how much ice we have on the globe and how it's changing. All right, so we know that we can look at this many different ways. That's an important part of science, right? Multiple methods are telling us the same thing, and we can see that we're losing ice all around the globe. So I want to dive directly into what are the impacts of this ice loss. Um, and an important thing for understanding the impacts is understanding that our glaciers and our ice sheets across our globe are invaluable storage, storage mechanisms, right? There are really important things that they're doing. So if we look at all of our water on our globe, about 2.5% of it is fresh water. And almost 70% of that fresh water is glaciers and permanent snow cover. And there are two important things here. All of that water that's being stored up by our glaciers, one, it's fresh water, and two, it's cold water. And those are really critical for how changes in glaciers are impacting all of these things downstream. And another thing to understand is that when we're gaining water from glacier melt is often a different time than when we're gaining it from precipitation. So if I have a glacier here sitting on my mountain, during winter, it's not giving me any water, right? During winter, it's just collecting snow, and any of the water that I'm getting downstream is from groundwater or maybe storage in a reservoir or something like that. But come along summer, and maybe I live in a place with dry, warm summers. And so that dry summer, I'm not getting rain. That's not helping me out at all. But that heat is, is melting my glacier. And so all of that water that I was storing through winter is now available for use. And that's a really important aspect of what glaciers are doing, is they're acting as our water storage units. So what has happened as we've seen this change in glacier melt around the world is that people are needing to adjust their systems to how much water there is. So for example, um, in uh, Peru, in the Andes, glaciers there provide a really important source for drinking water and agricultural water. And what they've seen is we're starting to melt more of these glaciers, right? And that's actually up um, to, uh, for a period of time provided a bump in the amount of water available. So more glaciers were melting and that meant there was more water available and people built hydropower plants, people developed agriculture um, so that we have, they have valuable exports in blueberries and in asparagus from Peru because they have more water available. And they could also have more people moving to um, these locations because they had more drinking water. But unfortunately, at some point, because we're depending on these glaciers, that bump as the temperature is rising, we're gonna get over that bump. And we're gonna say, well, there's not as much glacier area anymore. And so we're gonna start to see a decline in that water availability. And recent studies have shown that in the Cordillera Blanca in Peru, seven of our nine watersheds there are now starting to see declines in water availability. So there's an adjustment period as more water is available and we're starting to melt those glaciers. And then there's another adjustment period as we're losing those glaciers and that bump disappears. And we start to, having to deal with increasing declines in water. This is something that you can see happening also really clearly in Asia. 
And I want to explain this a bit before we look at, we're going to look at three different pictures that all have this kind of circle on them. And so all of this light blue, that is water available in these water basins from direct precipitation. Both of these other blues are water that is coming from glaciers. The balance melt, that means this is melt that um, if, the, if the glacier was just staying the same size, that's the amount of melt we would get, right? So, so this is a perfectly fine amount of melt from get, to get from a glacier, and it's not suggesting that there's any change in the glacier size to get it. But this um, melt over here is actually the imbalance melt, melt, and sorry that got cut off. But that is saying this is extra melt that's coming from these glaciers right now that's not actually being um, restored in this glacier storage system. So we're, we're borrowing against our future selves in depending on this kind of melt. So what you see across this region is this background color is the annual precipitation. It's, we get more precipitation down here in this area around the Himalaya, and then it becomes drier up here. And this is an average year. And you can get a sense that in this average year, um, our precipitation is doing the heavy load carrying for the water resources for these um, communities in all of these different watersheds. But if we now look at what happens in a drought year, we can see we still have this precipitation down here, but we're especially getting heavy drought up in this area. And suddenly these glaciers, in many cases, are providing 50% or more of the water resources being used in that watershed during a drought year. So these glaciers are this critical offset that's helping communities um, survive and continue with the same kinds of resources they need for drinking water, hydropower, and agriculture during drought years. But, of course, that means that during these years, a lot of these chunks have pretty big imbalance. So there's a lot of borrowing against our future that we're doing to help in these drought years. And at some point, we're not going to have these glaciers available to do this hard work for us. And we're going to need to adjust. And it's going to be particularly interesting in regions like this because of their political setting. So we have to think about these changes that are happening in the ice and how it's interacting with our human system. And here in this part of the world, we have boundaries between India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, and we have disputed boundaries. All of these are disputed boundaries up here. Um, there are kind of lines of agreement. But you can imagine as we're having our water resources diminish, there are going to be more conflicts about water resources, and that's not going to make political, economic um, uh, disputes about boundaries easier to solve. Another impact um, as we lose our glaciers, we can, we can look towards other areas of the world where we're maybe not worrying about disputed boundaries, and there are other sources of drinking water. Um, but for example, the European Alps. This is where recreation, tourism often depends on glaciers. And if we look at what's happening in these areas, you could see we were doing pretty well on our glaciers. This is um, showing us our uh, mass balance. So this is actually meters of water equivalent. I'm sorry, but I think the left end of all of my slides have been cut off. Um, so this is um, meters of water equivalent. And you can see that here in the late 1980s and into the 1990s, that's where we're really taking this dive um, in losing our glaciers. And this is me actually standing next to one in Italy, and you can see this is a classic sign of a retreating glacier. We have fresh um, new melt ponds that are forming, and we've left a lot of rocks around here. And they're simply not the same kind of exciting sp space to go explore as there was before. So there are places where local economies are impacted in this kind of way, um, not because of their drinking water sources, but because of what people come and see and do there. This can be true in areas, too, like Glacier National Park. In, um, when Glacier National Park was formed in the early 1900s, there were more than 100 glaciers in the park there. Um, today, there's roughly two dozen. And there's an expectation that most of those are going to disappear by about 2030. So not only does that mean people can't come and see this, but it also means that there are important impacts for the ecosystem there. In Glacier National Park, 
just as I mentioned, not only are these storing fresh water, but they're storing cold water, right? And that cold water is really important for the downstream ecosystem. There are fish and invertebrates that depend on having colder stream temperatures in order to live. And it was that cold water melting during the summer that's helping to keep those stream temperatures cool. And already in, in Montana, we see places where we're um, getting, fishing is being shut down on different rivers because water temperatures are becoming too warm. And that's already stressing the fish and the invertebrates in those areas. So there are these downstream ecosystem changes that are also um, coming as a result as we lose glaciers. And we can look at this happening in other systems too. For example, if we move up to Alaska, um, here we have uh, inland glaciers, and they're uh, melting, entering the Alaska coastal current. About 50% of the fresh water in the Alaska Gulf Coast is coming from glacier melt. That's a pretty substantial number. And not only are glaciers providing fresh, cold water, but as these glaciers move, because that's a key characteristic of a glacier is that it's moving, that's why it's not a permanent snow field. As it's moving, it's eroding and crunching up all of those rocks underneath it, and that's helping it release important nutrients like phosphorus and iron. And those are getting released through these stream systems into the um, coastal ecosystem and helping, for example, phytoplankton growth. So these glaciers are playing kind of a multiple, multiple aspects in making sure that these ecosystems are working properly. In Alaska, uh, the salmon fisheries in these area is about a billion dollar uh, annual economy. So the things that we're changing by changing glaciers in the ecosystem are again knocking up and influencing humans, how we depend on these systems um, for economics, for sustenance. As we think about, as we put this fresh water in, here it's moving into the Alaska, Alaska coastal current, which is moving that fresh water north up towards the Arctic. There are other important currents around the world too that are also being influenced by glacier melt. So here, this is a picture that I took off the coast of Northwest Greenland. These are all icebergs sitting out here in the ocean, slowly melting. Again, they're putting fresh, cold water into this ocean system, and that's changing the character of the ocean currents. This is what ocean currents look like around Greenland. We're bringing up warm, salty water from the Atlantic, and it's coming to meet polar water um, coming from the Arctic here that wraps around the coast. Well, now, all around the edge here, we're adding fresh water and large quantities of it. And that's actually changing the properties of those currents. Um, some of you may have heard about uh, discussions on slow, slowing some of the um, currents that happen here and the overturning of those currents, which are really critical for how our oceans circulate and the life that depends on it. And so we're changing that as we're putting more fresh and cold water into the system. And then as we're putting this fresh cold water into the system from really large areas of ice like Greenland and Antarctica, there's one topic that probably you thought, why didn't she already talk about this already, right? Sea level rise. This is the kind of thing that's showing up on our shores here, right? Um, here you're not, your fish in this area are not depending on cold glacial melt, <laughs> but we're right here at the coast and we're certainly thinking about sea level rise, what it looks like to have additional coastal erosion, what it looks like to have more regular flooding, what it looks like to have flooding in areas that we have never seen flooding before. All of this is connected to, to the ice around our globe. So there are two major sources of sea level rise. Um, one of them is ocean thermal expansion. As we heat up ocean water, those molecules actually expand and just that natural change in, that change in ocean temperature is making the water take up more volume. So that's a change just by changing the temperature of the ocean. But by losing land ice from around the globe, we're adding more volume to the ocean too. And that's the other main source of sea level rise. This is what that looks like today. 
So this is telling you that our, our rate of sea level rise um, here from the mid-90s up to today is around three millimeters of sea level rise per year, averaged over the whole globe. But that rate is increasing by about 0.1 millimeters per year every year, which doesn't sound very, like very much, but it really adds up, and we're already seeing those impacts around the coast. This is what total sea level rise looks like um, to the present. Here's what's happening because we're adding more heat to the ocean. That's the ocean thermal expansion part. And you can see that not quite double it, uh, is coming from ice. So ice is doing the heavy lifting here um, for changing sea levels. But it's, ice is not created equal around the globe. So these different sources of sea level rise um, are producing different amounts of um, input into the ocean and how much they're going to um, add to sea level rise into the future also changes. So now we're moving from looking at what's happened to today to what's gonna happen into the future. So here we are now. And if we think about what thermal expansion, so adding that heat to the ocean is gonna do for our sea levels into the future, this is meters of sea level. And you can see that we expect by 2100, we're gonna have maybe about um, 0.35 additional meters. So somewhere around an extra foot of sea level rise just from adding that heat to the ocean. And we have this envelope this range around that number based on how well we understand um, heat in the uh, future and how it's going to impact the changes in the ocean. And it's relatively well constrained here. Another source are those glaciers and ice caps. And actually up until today, um, most of our uh, water that was going into the ocean was coming from those small glaciers and ice caps because they were the most vulnerable and the most sensitive. So we were melting ice in Alaska and the Himalaya and Patagonia and these places first. Um, but there's only so much ice in those places, right? And so what they can do into the future is pretty narrow band because there's just not more ice than that in these small glaciers and ice caps. So we can see that in 2100, somewhere less than 0.2 meters will come from these smaller glaciers and ice caps around the world. And there's not a very big range here because there's just not a very big range in how much ice we have available. But we can now move to that biggest ice on Earth. And this is where numbers become much wider in their range. The Greenland ice sheet has about six meters of total sea level rise contained within it. The Antarctic ice sheet has about 60 meters of total sea level rise contained within it. So we're not talking about losing all of these ice sheets, right? These ice sheets are still going to be doing an important job of storing fresh water for us. But there's a lot of potential sea level rise there. And we don't fully understand how these ice sheets change. I was just telling one of the fellows earlier today, in the mid-1990s, glaciologists said, oh, we could go and measure the, the speed at which the, ice, the Greenland ice sheet is moving, and we could do it once, and our job would be done because these big ice sheets change really slowly over hundreds or thousands of years. Well, that was before we started getting these measurements from satellites. And once we actually were, had satellites in space and we were looking at repeat measurements, we realized these change really quickly. And there was a sudden mayhem in glaciology and there were lots of people working on it and lots of studies because we realized that these ice sheets can change really rapidly, but we're still catching up to understand how they do that because it's very difficult to see underneath an ice sheet. It's very difficult to even see within an ice sheet all these elements of it that we have to understand to know how they're gonna change into the future. So we have Greenland over here which is um, gonna contribute somewhere from not very much to way more than half of a meter, right? A very large range, um, but oh, certainly positive. And things get even crazier when we look over here at the Antarctic ice sheet, where there's a possibility 
that because we're warming that air temperature, warmer air can hold more water vapor so we can have more precipitation around Greenland. So there's a possibility that if we get so much snowfall added in the interior of the Greenland ice sheet, or Antarctic ice sheet, that Antarctica might actually reduce the amount of sea level we see across the globe. That seems quite unlikely. That's certainly not the end of the spectrum that I'm going to put my money on now, but we're still understanding these systems. On the reverse side, there are mechanisms of rapid ice loss that we're just now starting to wrap our heads around. And if some of those mechanisms of rapid ice loss that have to do with warming oceans and how quickly ice can retreat over the topography underneath it, then we can end up with numbers way up here um, in the well over uh, a meter of sea level rise from Antarctica by 2100. So it's these problems that are really interesting um, glaciologically right now because Right? If, as, if we're here on the coast, we want to be able to plan for when an extra foot of sea level rise is going to uh, arrive at our doorstep, or when an extra three feet of sea level rise is going to arrive at our doorstep. And we need to understand that that's not evenly distributed around the globe. So this is what it looks like today. Um, and you can see that there are areas where sea level has gone down and areas where it's gone up. And one of the factors is actually where ice is melting. So if we lose ice from the Greenland ice sheet up here, we're actually going to um, reduce sea level rise around Greenland. It's exactly the opposite of what you think. And the reason is the same, that mass of ice that was attracting, that was changing the gravity and attracting those satellites towards it because it had a lot of mass, which produced a lot of gravitational pull. If we're losing that mass, we're losing our gravitational pull, and we're raising sea levels far away. So, from the Greenland ice sheet, we're raising sea levels far away. And if we lose ice from the Antarctic ice sheet, we're raising sea levels in these places far away. So where our ice is melting is part of the, um, the solution of where it is that we're actually going to get sea levels rising. And the result is that many of these mid um, and lower latitude locations get much more um, sea level rise than we do at the poles because that's where we're losing the ice from. All right, so now a whole pile of impacts. But you sitting here, what can you do about it? This is, I think, one of the most important elements. And the thing is that all of these changes happening in, in glaciers around the world are happening for one fundamental reason, and that is climate change. And we understand climate change well. We understand that it's because we're putting more polluting gases into our atmosphere and that it's our human activity doing it. So there, anything that you do personally, within your community, within your family, within your organizations to address climate change is something you're doing to help ensure that we're keeping as much ice on this earth as possible. This is a um, website that I love from the University of Colorado. And you can go here, and they provide information on actions that you can take in a wide variety of different aspects. So for example, um, I pay a small amount extra to my uh, electric company so that all my electricity comes from wind in, in, instead of coal. I live in Montana, which is a, which is a fossil fuel heavy state. Um, I eat a bit more vegetarian food than, than I eat um, meat these days. I try not to travel as much, so it's a pretty special thing for me to have decided to come here so that I could speak to all of you. And I try not to say yes to all of those because I, I got on a plane and traveled a long way, right? Um, but w the most important thing that I think that you can do is absolutely free. It only requires talking, writing, speaking up, and that's communication. And I want to highlight one reason that I especially think this is so important for all of you to do. And I'm going to tell you a story about some of my attempts at communication. So um, Science Magazine, uh, a couple years ago, asked me to write a perspective about uh, the state of glaciers around the globe, how we know how we measure them, what the story is. And I said, great, I would really love to write this. I think it's a super important topic. And this is what I originally submitted to them. This was the start of my perspective. I said, when asked to address how glaciers are changing worldwide, the first word that came to mind was loss. 
thanks to re recent growth in global glacier and ice sheet research enabled by key monitoring advances, I can say with scientific confidence and personal witness that we are losing ice globally. I submitted this to the editor and they cut the entire thing. They said, uh-uh-uh, we can't have any of this. Look, you use the word I in doing this. There's actually never been a perspective written in Science Magazine that includes the word I. Because as a scientist, my job is to suss out the facts about the world and to provide you with solid information that has kind of like global consequence. Not to tell you my story about how I feel or emotions that I have or things that I've seen personally. But that is the most powerful way for us to communicate with each other and for us to inspire other people to understand these systems and to act to change them, right? To act on climate change, to be inspired to preserve ice. And so all of you need to be doing the communication and using I stories and talking about the things that you've learned, talking about solutions you've learned about and that you are using because there are limits to how I can tell this story as a scientist. And at some point we have to pass off this scientific information to all of you and have you share it with your families and your friends and your communities. So that's what I'm hoping all of you will do um, after today. That's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Twyla. That was just fantastic. And we really appreciate you ending with um, action items. So uh, I just want to remind everyone, again, that we're recording this for the Publix Radio, our media partner. And therefore, we have um, Sean and Aaron here who are carrying around microphones. When you raise your hand to ask a question, please be sure to hold the mic right up to your mouth so we can hear you. Right back there. Does global warming, like, affect the snowpack stability? Yeah, it does. Actually, I love that you brought that out. Oh, I just had a, a similar chat with one of the fellows today because one of the things that happen as you're raising temperatures is more often the precipitation falls as rain instead of as snow, right? So we can have more instances of having rain on snow events. And when you put rain on top of snow, it really destabilizes it. And you're, you're more likely to have avalanches. You're also more likely to lose your snowpack earlier on um, in the season. Another thing that climate change can do to snowpack is that um, we have areas where we have drought and we have exposed ground. And we're seeing more and more of that dust being moved around and then deposited on snow. So we have areas where we have dust on snow events. And that dust um, is able to capture uh, heat from the sun more easily and more quickly melt the snow um, that it sits on top of. So there are major ways in which climate change is, is affecting our snowpack, both how much of it there is, when, we, when, when the snowpack starts to build up, when we lose it, and how stable it is through the year. You showed a slide of the um, interaction of the Gulf Stream with all of the uh, water coming, up, coming down from the north. I'd like you to comment, perhaps, on what happens when the Gulf Stream shuts off. Does that improve our situation or does, and, and therefore make all of Europe uh, back into a little ice age or into a real ice age? Or, or is it lead to greater ice loss in, in the Arctic? Well, first I want to say that there's not any evidence that uh, in, a, in, in any short term period, decadal, um, probably even kind of a couple centuries that we would shut down uh, the Gulf Stream. There, are in, we see evidence for some slowing of, of some of those currents there, but um, not of this shut down. And, but I would say as, as we see changes in that system, the, all, all of the changes in, in the Earth system 
have both, there are both kind of negative and positive consequences depending on who you are and who you ask. Some of my neighbors in Montana might be pretty excited for things to be warmer during the year, but others are, are really not going to be pleased that they can't go fishing because temper, stream temperatures are too warm. Um, but because we as humans have really taken over the planet during the last 10,000 years, a period of relative stability, any of these ways in which we're dramatically changing the system we depend on is more likely to cause um, problems for humans and for the plants and animals that we depend on. Um, That was a great talk, thanks. Uh, can you add something about the effects of sea ice loss? Yeah, the effects of sea ice loss are uh, wide ranging. So it's important, I, first I want everyone to understand some critical differences. So um, sea ice is not ever affecting sea level, right? So, so we have, for example, the Arctic Ocean in the north and we're forming sea ice at the surface of that ocean um, each winter. Um, we're melting most of it um, during uh, the summer. And so because that mass of ice is being formed from the ocean water itself, uh, changes in sea ice don't affect sea level rise. That's a really important thing to um, keep in mind. The, but the changes that we do see in sea ice, we're most concerned about the changes happening in the northern hemisphere. We do see, see changes in sea ice around Antarctica in the south, uh, but there we're actually seeing instances where in some cases we're gaining sea ice, the, the motion of it is changing, but those changes aren't having as dramatic effect yet as they are having um, for the northern hemisphere where we have the Arctic Ocean covered by sea ice. And there we have multiple difference. So first, you can think as we are covering the ocean in sea ice, we're covering it with a white, highly reflective surface. And that reflection helps our incoming solar radiation from the sun, it helps reflect it back out. So in that way, when we have sea ice on top of the ocean, it's helping to protect that ocean water from taking up as much heat. So if we lose that sea ice, we're uncovering a very dark surface. I mean, you can just think of pictures of the planet, right, and the ocean looks almost black. And when we uncover that dark surface, the ocean is able to absorb more of the heat coming in um, from, from the sun. So in that way, as we lose sea ice, we're, um, it's easier for us to change the temperature of the ocean and to take up more heat into the ocean. But we can also see influences from losing sea ice, for example, along the coast. So we ha in the coast of Alaska, sea ice would form during the winter, and winter is also when we have more storms in that area, which produce big waves. And that sea ice along the coast helped to protect the coast from these really big storm waves and storm surges. Well, now that we don't have as much sea ice, or it's not lasting as long into the year, there's more coastal erosion, because all of these big storms can drive those um, waves right up into the coast. So you're seeing increased coastal erosion, not just from higher seas, but actually because of more exposure of the coast to the seas. Um, and one thing to also to think about um, when you're considering sea ice is there are kind of different types of sea ice. So there's sea ice that forms every year, and that's first year sea ice. It might form and then melt the next summer. But to get really thick sea ice, it has to be sticking around for multiple years. So multi-year sea ice is where we get really thick sea ice um, that can stay in some areas and, and, and protect those areas of land or provide um, ecosystems over multiple years. And we're seeing um, that a lot of that volume of ice, that deep volume of ice, is what we're losing. Um, so it's not just that we're changing the extent of sea ice, which kind of comes and goes season to season, but also that we're losing this, this thick old sea ice, which played its own unique role in the ecosystems. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Your presentation was so clear. Um, I've heard this alarming phrase that Greenland is in irreversible decline, and I was wondering if you might be able to com comment on that, please. And also, 
I did read somewhere I thought that there's a fear of that for West Antarctica as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really important um, topic when we think about land ice. And I don't have good news for you. Um, when we think about the uh, land ice in the Earth system, glaciers respond to warming over many years. So the changes that we've already made as far as putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, that warming is going to be influencing our loss of land ice for the next several decades. Um, at least. So even if today we, we, we stopped putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we would still see continued loss of land ice into the future because of this slower response for these very big um, systems of land ice. Um, and unfortunately, we would consider the vast majority of those to be irreversible on important human timescales. Um, so the decisions, the, the changes that we um, make in this system um, over just the next decade or two will be influencing how much ice loss we have in two, three, four hundred years, and actually for millennia after that. Um, the, when it comes to uh, thinking about, for example, West Antarctica, um, so here again we have our, our Antarctic continent and West Antarctica is this section over here. Most of this section here, East Antarctica, um, is, is sitting on fairly high ground underneath it. Um, but West Antarctica here, it's kind of like it sits in a big bathtub shape of ground. So the ice sits directly on the ground underneath it, but that ground is actually under sea level. And so as we eat away at the edge, if, this is, if our ice is moving, here's interior um, Antarctica, and the ice is moving out this way, if we're eating away at the edge here, and as we're going inland, it's just getting deeper and deeper, the topography underneath it, there's, no, there's nothing to stop losing that ice because it's becoming more and more vulnerable as more and more of it is exposed to the ocean water. So that, that shape of the topography underneath the West Antarctic ice sheet is why um, we are so concerned with what's happening there. And uh, multiple studies have demonstrated that we are uh, past a point of, we are in a, an, a pattern of ice loss that will continue that ice loss, but the question is how quickly will it continue? And that's a really fundamental difference. So I want to emphasize that we're not at a point now where we expect to gain any of this land ice back, unlike, for example, sea ice. If we, if we cooled the atmospheric temperature, then we could get more sea ice again. But we don't expect to gain any land ice. But the rate at which we lose our land ice is really critical to how well we can adapt to it and how well plants and animals can adapt to it. So at this point, our goal is to slow our loss of land ice, um, not to be stopping it or gaining land ice. 